Welcome to the Road to Recovery. Uh, this is Friday afternoon. Coming into March at last, and uh, my favourite time of the year. Autumn. Um, the fish, most of the animals now are in great condition, and you know this is a hunter's paradise. Not too hot this time of year. You know it's fiercely hot and prohibitive in the summertime, and uh, you know everything can struggle a little bit and. It's always tough for me to watch those animals out in the out in the fields baking under the heat with wool on those poor old sheep, you know, gasping and sitting underneath the trees. And um, you know, I just wanted to mention that you know it's it's been a really gentle year for the farmers, and uh, I can't believe it. But they're getting a fourth cut in even now as I was driving in from Pahia Tua today. Uh, incredibly green out there and it's, it's wonderful to see that uh, you know the farmers have got a little bit of a break in that regard unfortunately the the bottom has dropped out of wool uh, price once again and you know this is something where I really feel that um, New Zealand has let our farmers down and um, not working to promote a natural renewable product that is very green indeed and it really annoys me to hear people jump on some bandwagon to make the next person a pariah and say oh you know farming pollutes the waterways and um, uh, cows fart and it destroys the ozone layer and of course all of this is exaggerated nonsense, you know. Um, a lot of it has to do with poor farming practices of the past. Unfortunately, people get stuck in traditions and they never really question why they're doing something. They just do it without really considering it a hell of a lot. Things have changed. If you watched the project last night, there was a chap on there from up north, a farmer, who's cleaned up his waterways so much that he can drink the water now you know so he's planted out not just riparian strips but he's retired pieces of the farm that weren't particularly productive into native bush um, and that is of course not just a carbon sinkhole but it's also uh, a great filter for the uh, runoff and um, you know it's great to see that he's done things like that and lowered his stock numbers and he's getting just as much production if not more out of the fact that he's finishing his animals so well now the reason that i mentioned something like that on the program about mental health is that um, often people f feel a lot of pressure and stress especially when there's a lot of work on things are going hard you know, and, and things don't always go right on farms. And the last thing that people need is ignorant folks prejudiced against them on some bandwagon where everyone's having a pot at incredibly hardworking people who secure wonderful food for us. And, you know, doing it on your own, there's not a lot of people to talk to on a farm and, you know, things get extremely stressful. Sometimes work is just so flat out, you're just absolutely broken every day. And, you know, we really need to be on the side of our farmers and, and give them a hand, you know, up around our area in Ekadahuna and Pahiatua. There's a lot of farmers out there encouraging the general public, especially kids, to come out and help plant out the riparian strips that's down the waterways with native plants to encourage the native birds to come back and the insects to improve the soil and the waterways. And that's what we all want, all of us. Everyone in New Zealand wants the same thing. Farmers don't want to see their rivers running brown, but you've got to realise that sometimes we need to give them a hand and say, well, can we help? And once they get onto this and realise what a good thing it is, engaging the children to realise this is the way forward, this is how we improve things, and that's what we are doing. And it annoys me that when you talk about, you know, um, things like cattle producing methane, you really got to open the other eye and realise that there's a hell of a lot of trees growing on farms. No one ever takes into account the grass, how much oxygen that's reducing, how much carbon that's fixing. 
And these things are, are glossed over and forgotten, and just that one bad thing is what everybody concentrates on with looking at, without looking at the whole picture. All they do is concentrate on one tiny negative aspect. Now, not all farmers are great farmers. Um, my grandfather wasn't particularly good, nor was my great-grandfather, apparently. Not particularly good farmers. Not all of them are. But some of them are, and those are the best. They're the ones that will last. I think, you know, there's all this talk about planting trees and green and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I drive through the countryside, I get up on the hills and I look across where the 90-mile bush used to be before it got burned off, and now all there are is these nasty, scarred hills that cannot be profitable. But this is where the government needs to get in and retire these blocks properly and say, well, let's have a plan for this. Let's get some manuka up into the gullies and get the old manuka honey going and actually have blocks that are, you know, just manuka and then the block next door of mixed natives fenced off. Yes, there will be a little bit of other stuff coming across into the manuka, but once it gets away, it crowds so hard, nothing can really get through it, not even gorse. In fact, manuka will crowd gorse out given time. So it's an incredibly hardy, valuable plant for us, not just for its timber or or for its honey, but the fact that it's a tree and it's producing oxygen and it's a beautiful thing. You know, this is something that we really all need to get behind and see some more coordinated plans, short-term, mid-term and long-term plans about how we're going to develop New Zealand in the future and where we're going. We're definitely, as most of the world is, drifting away from eating meat, but this is something that we can phase out rather than, you know, knee-jerk reaction, shock and pain unnecessarily. What we need to do is identify all of the most productive land in the country and save it and make sure it doesn't go underneath houses because that will be an absolute tragedy that we give up extremely valuable agriculture and horticulture land um, just for the sake of putting more people in houses. That's ridiculous. If anything, we need to wake up a bit and realise that rather than spreading out like a cancer, we need to go up, up, up and build five, six-storey buildings where people can live in big blocks where they don't need cars and stuff like that. They can take public transport. You know, a lot of places in Auckland now are coming without car parks, and I think that's a great thing. You know, it's high time that we got away from cars, from capitalism, from greed, and I'm hoping, if nothing else, that this COVID brings us together. Now my show was all about mental health and the reason I was banging on about farming today a bit is the fact that we need to take care of all of our people and that includes our farmers. So instead of making them our enemies, they need our support and realise that they're doing a tough, often thankless job and we need to appreciate these good people. They are, after all, the backbone of our country. Them and the essential workers... um, have never really been appreciated that much and it's high time that we did and I'm not talking about necessarily singing their praises today and forgetting them tomorrow I'm talking about a shift in attitude to realise that you know these people who have been underpaid for so long um, you know the doctors not so much the doctors but the nurses definitely and the supermarket workers and the truck drivers and all those people who are risking their health to keep going, and and they need to, I understand. They've they've got a job to do, but it's more than that. I think they're pretty brave, and I I see a lot of people frightened, a lot of people get agitated over this. Um, We just need to calm down a bit, take a chill pill, and just realise that COVID has basically been kept um, pretty much to the far north. It hasn't spread throughout the country. We've We've been lucky. We haven't done it particularly well, and I've still got a lot of criticisms. I really believe that, you know, long ago, a year ago, in fact, even before COVID broke out, I was warning about a pandemic. A year before COVID broke out, and I was saying that we need quarantine facilities then, and I'm still saying it now. Why? I don't know. 
you know, we should have accommodation for 20,000 people completely isolated from the rest of society so that we know we're safe, we guarantee we're safe. One person breaks isolation and millions and millions and millions of dollars are lost, the country is thrown into chaos, all because of the actions of one person. One. That's not good enough. And it's not so much that person I blame, because human beings are human beings. They do what they do. They're selfish, they're greedy. So, yeah, I'd like to give them a horse whipping, but that's not the point. The point is it never should have happened in the first place. And if people were isolated away from the rest of everybody else, well, they cannot mingle with society, then we are safe and safety is more important than the individual freedoms of one person to go down the road and get a hamburger and infect a whole city. It's just ridiculous nonsense. And to say that we're annoyed about this or we're angry is not good enough. It's just not good enough. Everybody's been put in jeopardy because everything is half assed You know, we're putting people in hotels that were never designed to do this kind of a job. They are not quarantine facilities. They are only a temporary measure while we get something better sorted. But where is that something better? There is nothing been done. Oh, well, never mind. We'll just stick another plaster on it. Stick another plaster on it. It's not going to work. It's never going to work. This pandemic has been gentle. Only two people in a hundred have died, which is no more than the influenza. So we've been very, very, very lucky. We have dodged a bullet here. But we're not ready, and we still haven't learned the lessons. And everyone's getting tired of this. They're sick and tired of it all over the world. I mean, some of these poor buggers have been locked away for months. And... The mental health issues there, the cabin fever, a lot of people are not used to being locked up like that, isolated from society. They've taken all these social interactions for granted in the past, not realising that this was a privilege, that this was a freedom that they never considered before. And now, when they find that these freedoms are taken away, that these privileges are there no more. You can't go to the pub, you can't go to the restaurant. Not today, not tomorrow, not for the foreseeable future. That has a dramatic effect on some people. And it affects everyone, but some people are affected dramatically. They're, they're shocked, they're fearful, they're anxious, they're worried, they're lost. And this is where we need to engage people to keep them busy doing something positive. So this requires good leadership to get people together to focus on them doing something that they can do from home to contribute and be part of and be engaged so that we can get through things together rather than you just being locked inside and watching every DVD you've got for the hundredth time. It pretty soon gets boring and people don't know how to live in isolation. Myself, I've lived in isolation for over a decade. So what you're going through in COVID, I go through every single day of my life. And I never come out of lockdown and it never changes. And that's what it's like for a lot of people who suffer from depression. You get locked away and isolated from society and those freedoms taken away every day of your life. You're so poor you can't afford a burger or a steak. There are no friends around other than those who, well, at least 50% of them will be terrible criminals and that's why um, they're sitting on the Benny along with you. So, you know, even those around you drag you down. Apart from the fact that you don't have money, you can't afford power, it's freezing cold, you're hungry, you've got no one to talk to, life can be very, very, very tough for people who suffer from mental health issues. And it's not going through those mental health issues, it's all the life that is associated with that. Throwing people on the heap in that way is not good enough. And this is where we need community gardens and games and things that can engage people rather than just say, you sit at home, shut up, go away, don't be a problem, just get out, away. What 
society, including women, should be saying this rather than go away. They should be saying, come in, engage. How can we get you into a routine again of getting up in the morning, doing work that you enjoy, going home, having exercise, and get back into a regular sleep pattern? If you live a sick person on their own, they're not suddenly just going to get better because you've locked them in a room, are they? No. People who are unwell need help, and without that help, the chances of getting better are not that great, and that's why I do what I do, is to try and give people hope, ideas, that, hey, maybe there is something I can do, and You've got to start off with very, very small steps, small achievable things. And they don't have to be a regular thing because then you kind of feel chained to it. You have to go for a walk no matter what on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It becomes a grind. It becomes a trap. What you've got to do is think, what do I really want to do? Think about things that you can get a little bit enthusiastic about and that enthusiasm can lead on to excitement and go down a path but if you never look you never find and what tends to happen is as you are getting shut down by the government by winds and by everybody else through a lack of finances mostly a lack of social engagement you get more and more and more isolated and you look less and less because you are being closed in, down, 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 down to a room, down to a radio, every single day, drinking cups of tea, looking out the window, and getting worse. So, you know, how do we improve the mental health of our people? It is by engaging rather than pushing them away and simply being able to talk to someone about how they're not feeling so grand doesn't solve a damn thing you've got to get back to the root of the problem the root of the problem is you're mentally unstable you're jiggly up and down and all over the place it's hard to concentrate bad things have happened to you and you need to build up good things slowly positively securely and firmly with plenty of foundation because as you recover it's not going to be up, up, up and away in my beautiful balloon. You're going to fall every now and then. You're going to collapse. You're going to fail. And it's going to hurt. And you're going to slump way back down. So for something there to catch you, people to talk to, or even if you just need to go somewhere really peaceful for two or three days just to get your head together again and come back. Because often things can go wrong, you know, um unjustifiable things, people make mistakes, you get punished unfairly and unnecessarily and you've got to deal with it and if you're not in a good mental state sometimes it's very difficult to deal with people when they've made mistakes and they belligerently argue with it that they haven't and you're suffering and trying and trying and trying to fix the problem and sort it out and eventually you might get there, but it's so exhausting, so mentally exhausting to get through to somebody that they have made an error and they need to fix it. I've been battling against horizons for two years now and the battle continues on. They don't send bills, then they send you a penalty with no time to pay. And when you ring them up, there's no one there. When you go to their website, there's nothing there. When you go to their office, they're closed with no sign saying when they're open. And they do this year after year after year. It's very, very, very hard sometimes to battle away at institutions. Sometimes you just need to throw a rock through the window and say, wake up. Sometimes that's what it takes. But saying, I oh, will, never mind, and turning away will never, ever solve a single thing hoping that things go away is the least likely to solve anything ever so you know it is important that we do stand up that we do say things rather than just turn your back and ignore it and go oh well never mind there's nothing i can do that's bullshit that's a cop out there's always something you can do and it's your responsibility to look out not just for yourself but for others as well to always consider others and if anything I hope 
that maybe parents have a little bit of a think about teaching their children about morals because children don't seem to have any. Common courtesy, respect, generosity. These are things that don't come natural to children. Children are naturally nasty and vicious and selfish. That's what they are. When they're young, they don't have morals. Morals are a learned thing. And they're a damn good thing. I like to be treated well, I like to treat others well, if I can. And if people treat me badly, well, I'll get it back double, don't you worry. So, you know, it's all about how we raise those around us. Not just our friends, when we tell people certain things aren't acceptable, like making fun of somebody, you know, because they're not well. Um, physically or mentally, you know, making someone hurt for no good reason, just for your entertainment. Not only is that a childish thing to do, it's an extraordinarily cruel thing to do, and you certainly wouldn't want it done to you. So, you know, always be a little bit introspective, I would suggest, and think, well, how would I feel about that? And if you can see someone that's bloody hurt, it's just a word. You don't need to be, oh, ah, tell me everything that's wrong with you, bloody, bloody, blah, and then you just sit there and don't care anyway. Just a kind word. Just an, all right, mate, it's all right. You're going to be okay. And sometimes that's all it needs. Just a little bit of reassurance and someone saying, hey, I, I'm on your side, okay? I do care about you and, you know, you're all right. And that can make a huge, huge difference in people's lives. I can't believe how... Time runs away on us. I was intending on reading a story today and I never quite got round to it because once I get on a roll, you know, talking about our society and what I what I would like to see, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bang on for about three more years and after that I'm gonna Robinson Caruso on it, find myself an island and run away forever, I think. Um, but in the meantime I do what I can to try and help and you know that's where I'm very very grateful for people like Michael and Veronica and the sponsors of Arrow Radio here including New Zealand on air it's good to see that you know people put in the time and the money and the effort to work for their community and to bring them together um, the wire wrapper has been serviced by Arrow Radio for many years now and it's a wonderful service that kind of helps bring everybody together and gives folks like me a voice where I wouldn't necessarily have any kind of public forum and it's very nice that Wairapa TV have come on board and now we've got our friends up in the Hawke's Bay tuning in too so it's expanded thanks to the work of Michael and Veronica um, they, they work ever so hard here and um it's tough, you know, things go wrong behind the scenes and they're scrambling to fix things, organise things, begging for money all the time, where this is not just a money-making exercise banging out the same old rock and roll tunes you've heard a thousand times before. This is actually a not-for-profit community service of really interesting New Zealand music and lots of interesting people from different walks of life. So... It's a shame that radio stations like this don't have a higher profile and aren't pushed a little bit more by the communities that they serve because this is kind of like by the people for the people. This is a, a groundswell movement where it's folks looking after their neighbours. You know, this is all about us here in this community, not what's happening with, with Harry and Megan or whatever, it's it's you and me here together, us in this life, this country, this time, you know, and that's what's important. Not some, you know, clown on the TV you're never going to meet. That's, that's just a distraction. You know, the more time you spend in your community getting around, getting out and to know it, the more you realise there are so many things that you skipped past and took for granted and if you actually slow down a little bit and check out some interesting spots around your town, you'd be surprised what's about. And, you know, this place is not too far away. If you can get a ride, all well and good. If not, 
jump on the bus if you can and get out somewhere different but if you can grab a lift with someone I like to give my mates a, a lift out to Castle Point out on the coast here every now and then we just go out there have a look at the lighthouse and have a walk on the beach and you know it's one of those true gems of the wire wrapper not that many tourists get there and if you're real lucky you'll get dolphins come right in by the cafe and you can sit there and have a cup of coffee and and watch some dolphins play in front of you it's it's an incredibly beautiful thing and we are so very very privileged to live in such a magnificent country and it's a shame that we have such a high rate of depression in this country so you know, to get us over the COVID blues, I'd like to encourage as many people as I can, while the weather's still on our side, to get out there, walk on those beaches, get down those rivers, get into the bush, get away from the cities and enjoy small towns in New Zealand and the f good folks in those small towns. Support them. Bring your dollars into their town and spend it on food and stuff there to help them out and enjoy the magnificence of this country you know there are fewer places fewer and fewer like ours on earth and you know we live in an absolutely beautiful place we live in paradise here and it upsets me that so many people suffer from mental health issues and I think it has a lot to do with capitalism and technology and cities and that's where our focus is, where really our focus should be on the glorious things we have, on the calmness, the peace, the serenity, the beauty of our country. Those are the things that we should be thinking about right now, looking after each other and looking after the country and enjoying it. Right, that's me for another day. Thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. I'll be back next week, next Friday, and uh, we'll do another session. I'll definitely read you a story next week. Until then, look after each other. Thanks very much for tuning in. Let your friends know, and uh, be safe. Look after each other. Thanks. Bye for now.